And what happened was I was I got a refi on my house, thinking that I was changing my loan from a variable rate loan to a fixed rate loan. Except for there was a question about some fees, and uh, I wanted to use my own notary, and they wouldn't let me, and so they promised me that they were going to not charge me for the notary. So I just happened to look at the fees and saw that I was charged for them and some other fees that we hadn't agreed to. So I pulled that document out and went to talk to the broker and stopped signing. His answer wasn't acceptable to me, so I went on vacation for three weeks, came back, and my loan had closed. So I knew something was wrong, and I started investigating. I found forgery. I hired a exp uh, handwriting expert. I went into the bank and, with an officer of the bank, went through my documents and showed that I had multiple forgeries in my loan file. Well, fast forward five years, <clears throat> what I didn't know is that I didn't have the same loan that I applied for. I applied for a fixed rate loan, but in five years, my loan adjusted up like a lot of those loans did. I didn't even know that was possible because my prior loan was a variable rate loan. It didn't do that. Isn't that a crime, Pamela, for someone to switch you from a fixed to a variable without telling you? Isn't that a crime? Right. I believe that's called bait and switch um, or predatory lending, although it probably falls in that category. Uh, so, But I didn't know that that had happened. I, we went back and forth on the fees, and then I finally just gave it up. And, and just you know, at, the, at the time it was downy, they never really investigated it, so I just kind of let it go, thinking it was just the fees. But when I found out that my loan had gotten swapped because my payment had just so much, I was pissed. I was so mad. How much did your loan jump when you saw that? It adjusted up by about $450 in one month. In one month, up $450. And you said, how could this happen in a fixed loan? Right. So I thought, but I had uh, interest. I had also taxes and insurance that were in my loan. So I called thinking there was a mistake. Maybe somebody had overcharged me for the insurance or something like that. And they said, oh, no, that's the kind of loan you have. And then I was mad because then I knew that five years ago my loan had been swapped and I never knew it. And I knew that the bank had to know because I went in with an officer of the bank and they knew what they offered me and they knew what I got. But I never realized. Do you remember that officer of the bank's name? I don't. I wish I did. I have a stripe written down. Is that the U.S. bank? At that time? Right. At that time, it was Downey Savings, and they, they later became U.S. Bank. That's right. So uh, so I, I started calling. I heard a couple months later, I paid my payment, the new payment, but my grandma died, and you know, that extra amount of money was, it was just, I could do it, but it was getting difficult. And so I, I kept up with my payments. I started calling about modifying my loan because I heard about this modification thing. And this was early on before most people knew about it. And nobody called me back. I called and called and called. Finally, about March, I just gave it up, and I kept paying my payment. And in about April, somebody suddenly called me out of the blue and says, you know what, I don't know why you're calling because your loan's not behind. And so I explained the situation, and they said, well, we can modify your loan, and they gave me some terms, and they said, um, they ended up calling me back, and they said, listen, don't pay your payment, don't worry, the worst thing that happens is late fee, we're going to get this done for you. So I was like, okay. But then there was a matter of a $1,000 fee that they wanted to charge me, and I said, I really think that you ought to waive that fee because you knew that my loan was forged, and you didn't do anything about it. So I think that you're also accountable. So they went to check, and um, it was the last day of my payment. It was the April 6th. And I had never had a late payment, and I was getting nervous. And so I called up and I said, you know what, this is the last day. What happened with that $1,000 fee? And they said, oh, they're not going to waive it. And I said, did you tell them that my loan was forged? And then he said, well, do you want me to talk to a supervisor? And I said, of course I want you to talk to a supervisor. And I was thinking to myself, who did you talk to? Like somebody at the water cooler? So I'm waiting for a, a supervisor to call me back. And a collection person calls me back about April 29th. And I explain the situation to them, and they say, wait a minute, we're getting about a 1,000 calls a day from people who say they don't know they have this kind of loan, but they're not saying their loan was forged. If your loan's forged, we have to investigate, we can't collect from you, we can't modify, collection activities on hold. So I ended up talking to two supervisors, and they tell me that. What year was that, Pamela, that, that they said it's on hold? That was in 2008. That was April, I can tell you exactly the date, that was April 29, 2008. And so I'm thinking that they tell me that they're going to put my loan in legal, they're going to investigate. So about May 16th, I get this letter that says, we're not going to accept your payment when two payments are due. Well, I had my payment set up automatically, and I had canceled the April one when they told me not to pay it, but I hadn't canceled the May one. So it had gone out. So I call them up, and I, and I explain the situation, and I said, listen, that's okay, because you told me not to pay it, so that was an accident. And um, so then they end up they. They end up asking me if I want my check back, and I said, yeah, send it back to me just so it's not floating around, and that was it. Well, I learned later in another conversation, because every collections would call me, and every time they would call me, it would be the same story. That I would tell them the story, they would say, but in June, they said, oh, we can see that your file just went to legal in May, the end of May, so it really didn't go when they told me to, and that we're going to, we can't talk to you. And I don't know if you, they said, we can see that it didn't really go until the end of May. So it's illegal. You're going to expect, so they tell me, you know, 
We can see that your loan just went into legal in the end of May. It's don't worry, legal's going to send you some paperwork and you'll have to respond to it and so forth. So I'm thinking my loan's in legal. Meanwhile, nobody ever tells me that I need to pay. I tell them the whole story every time. And then they tell me the same story every single time. We can't talk to you any further. Your loan's in legal. We can't talk to you about anything. You have to talk to legal. Even if it was referred to a supervisor, they would tell me the same thing. You've got to go to legal. So I'm thinking my loan's in legal. In the end of July, I get a notice of default. And I call up, and it's July 15th. And I remember it vividly. And I talked to a lady named Leanna. And I said, is my house really in foreclosure? You told me you were investigating forgery. I explained the whole thing. And she says, oh, legal made a mistake. They were supposed to set a flag in the computer, and they forgot. So I said, OK, so take it out. And she said, I can't do that. Only legal can do that. So your attorney needs to write them a letter. So I said, well, you know, I'm getting concerned about that because supposedly my file's been being illegal, being investigated. I haven't heard anything. My attorney's called. My attorney's written. Nobody's gotten back to either one of us. And I'm concerned that legal is, you know, is the stopping point and that this is that having them be responsible for this is the problem. She's like, don't worry. Just write it on the outside urgent. You know, she tells me what to write. So I go to my attorney. I tell him. He writes a letter. We hear nothing. So finally, I had a second. Finally, about September, I stopped paying my second because I think I'm wasting my money because it's just like this runaway train that's going to foreclose on my house and I can't do anything about it. And then about November, the beginning of November, I heard about this FHA event that was being held on um, November 1st. So I went to the event, and the lady said, oh, it was Downey Savings at the time. They're terrible. You're going to have to sue. Their investors are terrible. So I went back to my, and, and then meanwhile, my second, which was Washington Mutual, said, well, you know what? We'll modify your loan if it helps you out. And I said, well, I don't really think that's the problem, but sure, why not? So they give me all the paperwork. They give me a contact. And then I go back to my attorney and I said, we're going to have to sue. So November 7, 2008, we filed this lawsuit that's just now coming to trial six years later through various ways to keep it from getting to trial. And uh, then all of a sudden, we hear from their attorney, um, Swenny, Richard Swenny, and he's, he tells my attorney, oh, wait, that loan's already been modified. And so I asked my attorney, well, how could they modify the loan? Because they never gave me any paperwork. And so he goes back to them and says, well, what terms did you give her, and how did you modify the loan? Because she never turned in any paperwork. And he said, oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We need her to turn in some stuff. So he tells me the stuff, and I start getting it together. Then meanwhile, he calls my attorney back, and my attorney tells me, he goes, I got this call from Johnny, and they say, um, we're not going to modify your loan because you don't meet the, the federal guidelines. And I'm like, what? How can they decide that when they don't even have my paperwork? So I ran for election in my city, and I was an appointed official, and I call up my friends, and I get the phone number from my congressman to contact them directly, and I say, did you guys pass some law that says that you can decide not to modify my loan without any paperwork? And he's like, oh my god, no. So he contacts the FBI, he contacts all the oversight, like the OCC and all the organizations that are in oversight for the banks. And meanwhile, I tell my attorney they're messing with us, so we went and got a restraining order. Then at my house, I got this Christmas card. And it was after the restraining order, and it had somebody else's name on it. Now, I had bought my house new, and it was a name called Tim Rasick. And I didn't know this person, so I Googled the sender to see if it was anybody I knew, and it was somebody in the real estate business. And I just had this feeling, and I told my attorney, my house has already been sold. He's like, no, it hasn't. Don't worry, we have a restraining order. So, sure enough, the, grant, the judge grants a restraining order, but then he requires, and I completely think that hopefully he would rethink this decision today, that I have to pay all the back payments and the fees, and I have 20 days to do it. This amounts to about $24,000. Now, obviously, I didn't plan for that because initially, when they told me, if there's one forgery in your loan, you're not going to be responsible for anything. And I said, well, I don't have one. I've got 12. I know because I already hired a handwriting expert. So I'm thinking, not that I'm going to get a free house, but that I'm going to be in a good position to negotiate a good loan with them and move forward. So and that they're going to work with me because I'm, I'm still thinking they don't want to foreclose on houses. That's what I'm thinking. But I've since learned that's not necessarily the case. So my... Um, my attorney gets a restraining order, and in order to get a preliminary injunction, they order that I have to pay this money. Well, I could pay the payments, but not the fees. So I had different uh, ways I was going to borrow the money, but one of my plan B was I'll file for Chapter 13 bankruptcy. We'll stop everything. I'll reorganize. January is a really good month for my business. I'll make the difference and you know, just you know take care of it. Then I'll deal with all the excess fees and everything that they put me through in the lawsuit after that. Just want to save my house because I owned my house 19 years. I bought it in 1990. I owned it new. I was the only person that ever lived there. Um, I had my children were born there and I had a nanny to live with us that was more like a grandma that was their caregiver so our whole way of life was in Rancho San Margarita. So this was the only house your children had ever known right. and you were thrown out of it at what date 
And how did they kick you out of your own house when they hadn't filed the correct paperwork? Right. They ultimately, what happened was I came home after doing the plan B for the bankruptcy and there was a notice on my door that my house had been sold. I had not been notified that there was a date to be sold. In fact, my attorney called and said there's a stay on this house. She's got seven more days. We knew like how long I had. We already had the plan. And they said, I know. And in that moment, I said, that means that they've done this before and they'll do it again. They are thumbing their nose at the law. I said they could have at least pretended like they didn't know that they broke the law, but they just admitted it. So they clearly don't fear the law. So I said about continuing to contact my congressman, the OCC. I mean, I, I tried to contact them. I did everything I could. But one of the things I did was I contacted U.S. Bank because I found out that they had taken over on November 21st. And I gave them this big, long email. And the vice president of U.S. Bank said to me, oh, come on now. You don't want to sue. Because I said, if you don't fix this, I'm going to sue. He goes, you don't want to sue. You don't want to go through all that time and expense. And I said, you're damn right I'm going to sue. And I said, and I'll pick at your offices with my kids in a little wagon if I have to. And the only reason I didn't do that back then was my attorney told me to hold off on the picketing. So I tried everything. Thank you very much. That was Pamela Raglan. I'm sorry for the uh, little defect in the audio, but she just settled. Now remember, she wasn't a mom and a dad fighting. She was a single mom with major responsibilities for two little children fighting the big, mean, nasty U.S. Bank. And they saw where she was going, where the judge was going, and the jury was listening, and they just cut a deal. Today, I just got the word today, right before we came on the air, I just thought that's important to you to know that if a single mom who doesn't have the background that Miss Valerie Lopez here has of having her own mortgage packaging company, if she can push U.S. Bank into a corner, they say, uncle, uncle, I give up. Okay, okay, we'll settle out of court. Here's a couple million. We don't know how much money she got. And you're probably going to see her website, raglandversususbank.com, disappear. I'll bet that was part of the deal. She's got to make it disappear off the Internet. So if you're watching live tonight, go look up her video, and listen to her story. I'm sorry, my audio was a little bad, but we're back here in the studio live with a lady that knows what she's talking about because she has five properties. That's correct. And did you have loans on most of those properties? I did. I had eight loans on them. Eight loans on five properties, and now you have canceled and wiped out all the loans by finding fraud. Is that right? Yes. You know, one... One item I and you're just appealing one of these properties they're fighting you on. Actually, if you can believe it, I have four appeals going on right now. Four, four appeals. Yes, the, the judge that took Judge Kwan's place, her name is Catherine Bauer. She's an ex-senior attorney for Bank of America, and she's sitting on the bench. And essentially, she's uh, it's just incredible as far as some of the decisions that she's made. And so you're appealing it to what, the California Appeals Court or the federal? Uh, well, I have um, three in the bankruptcy appellate panel, and I have one that is going up to San Francisco. Which means, when you say San Francisco, you mean what, the federal? Federal, yes. The se Ninth the District Federal Appeals Court? That's correct. In you, San Francisco. How did you skip the first, the federal court? Well, essentially what happened is that the bankruptcy case, what, well, I should take a step back. When I saw all the shenanigans and recognized that it was unsecured debt, and it's not my opinion, it's the law that sets the restrictions. And when I saw that they did not meet those restrictions, I thought this is unsecured debt like a credit card. So it's unsecured debt like a credit card. Correct. These home loans that you had on real property suddenly or deliberately by the banks or their attorneys or their servicer or merge or somebody involved, mm -hmm. somebody made them unsecured by the fraud they committed in producing the documents. Yes, the, the party that... That's what people need to remember. When they break the law, your home mortgage isn't secured anymore. No longer attached to the house. It's no longer attached to the house. And I think this lady... Ms. Lopez can explain to you, because again, she was in the business for more than 20 years. 
She was trained by Barron, right? I was by the best mortgage bankers, um, Glenn Pickering, Bob Newberry, Bob Urey, uh, Sandy Lewis, Dan Harkey. So I've worked with the best. So she knows probably more than your attorney that's telling you, no, 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 ignore that. Correct, right. Because <laughs> you you go to any average attorney, they're going to look at you, take as much money as they can get from you, and then they're going to call up the bank and say, how much will you pay me under the table to give her bad advice? That's probably what's going to happen. So, yeah, so essentially what I did is when I saw that, essentially they did not meet the laws, prior to forming mortgage-backed securities, and they were giving me such a hard time also as far as committing all the, the crimes and all the perjury, et cetera. I just thought, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip from a BK11 to a BK7, list it all on Schedule F uh, on my petition, from an 11 to a BK7. Oh, from 11 to a 7, correct it. Correct. BK, bankruptcy. Correct. Okay. And um, what I did is I listed it on Schedule F as unsecured debt. You and listed all your home loans as unsecured debt. That's, well, that's what the law says. The law says... It, now, when you say which law, are you are talking about California Government Code Section 272881? Well, there's, there's several. That's one. There's, there's uh, actually four that we want to focus on. California Commercial Code Section 9109? That's another one as well. That, those pertain to the assignment of deed of trust, stating that you have to go ahead and submit those assignments of deed of trust to make sure that we always know who owns the lawful mortgage loan Submit it to package. the county recorder. That's correct. But the other um, commercial codes are, there's California Commercial Code 3203, subsection D. There's California Commercial Code 3-115. And then we also have California Commercial Code 7-501, as well as California Commercial Code 9-321. Those set the, the restrictions, essentially. Those are the restrictions. So essentially, when I saw that they did not meet those restrictions, um, at that point, I went ahead and put it on Schedule F, and uh, essentially, we discharged it. It was not challenge at all whatsoever. It wasn't challenge. You discard your home mortgage loans on Section F of your bankruptcy. Schedule F. Schedule F of your bankruptcy papers in Section F. Correct. And it was not challenged. It was not challenged, no. Then why are you appealing? Why well, is there a primarily because what happened was the bankruptcy was discharged in May... Uh, 14th of 2012 and there was an ongoing appeal going concerning Judge Kwan's decision to go ahead and lift a stay irregardless of the fact that there was so much fraud on the court so I was appealing that decision essentially that went that was still open when it was discharged in May 14th of 2012 and what happened is the judge in LA Judge Perkinson he chose to ignore all the, the, the felony crimes that were going on. I, I actually wrote my appeal, and it spelled out exactly what the crimes are. And I believe it's misprison of a felony. If yeah. any government official sees or is, has attention that was... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Essentially, if, um, if they are aware of any kind of felony crime, then they have... It's their responsibility to report the crime. And so they didn't. So anyway, what happened is he dismissed the case because of lack of jurisdiction. I never actually chose his court. I was put there by a, a, a clerk's error. So anyway, you I You were thought, put there by clerk's error? Yes. Yeah, what happened is I actually selected bankruptcy appellate panel in Pasadena, and some clerk decided to go ahead and open a case in um, the bankruptcy appellate panel in Pasadena, as well as one in district court. So it caused massive confusion. And so I ended up in this court. So Pike Duncan, what they decided to do is they said, Judge Kwan, I mean, Judge Ferguson, you know, she, you realize that you don't have jurisdiction over this case. She never picked you. So why don't you dismiss her case anyway? <laughs> they, they put that in writing? Yes, they did. You have a copy of that? I do. Mm -hmm. It's in my court record. And I wrote back, Judge Ferguson, they're right. You don't have jurisdiction. I never chose you. Send me back to BAP. But he, he went ahead and did what Pike Duncan asked, even uh, though he knew about the crime. The judge did dismiss it because they asked for it. 
Just because they asked for just it. Just because, because they asked for it. And then also, he, because he had no jurisdiction, he admitted it, what he did to give Pike Duncan and the other parties involved, he went ahead and put his, his thoughts. I'm dismissing it due, due to lack of jurisdiction. And also, it's secured. It's like, what a, that's incredible. He made a judgment after he dismissed it. At, well, as he dismissed it, he dismissed it, saying he didn't have jurisdiction, and then added his two cents to at the bottom tail of it. Yeah, to prejudice any further judge that would look at it. Mm -hmm. That anybody in the public would see it and say, yeah. "Oh, okay, well, federal so, judges giving him." So you're appealing it. Well, that one I didn't really care about primarily because the bankruptcy had been discharged. It's been now like over two, or close to two years, and I thought I just need to wait for three more, you know, three more months, and then no when can come back and attack me at all whatsoever. It'll be time barred. It's too late for anybody to come after me, even the, the U.S. trustee. It's too late. It, so it, you had, what, $2 million worth of loans on five properties? Um, I want to say it was more like maybe $1.5 million. Okay, so $1.5 million, and you're going to end up $1.5 million better off because they committed crimes. Right. And well, I, I do plan. And you on, caught them. I caught them. And I, I do plan on going after the judges as well, um, just because the bottom line is that it's been, it's treason, essentially, is what they did to me. I mean, essentially, their responsibility was to uphold the law, and they didn't. And they deliberately thwarted the law. Say that again. They did what? They've committed treason. 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 What's the penalty for treason? I'm not sure what the, the I'm not sure what it is actually. Well, actually, I don't want to say it too loud because, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we know what the penalty for treason is. So, yeah, I think, you know, the appellate judges are going to look at this and they're going to say, do we really want to make our brethren in the lower court guilty of treason? Is there some way we can fishtail through this? Oh, and, they're trying, and I'll tell you. We snake our way through this and give her a little bit of what she wants and yet not put our brother's head in a noose for being hanged for treason. I think that's what they're probably trying to do. So whatever they decide, you've got these five properties cleared now? Well, I still have... you got three of they're them still, They're clouded. The titles are they're clouded. clouded. They're so clouded. You, but you got three cleared. No, I don't. All five no. are cleared. I have them. Okay, well, technically, by law, thank goodness for Congress, essentially, all of those those um, liens are discharged as unsecured debt. Because that, the fact of the matter is, it's their unsecured debt. It's not my opinion. It's the law, the, the code that I just read to you. Got it. So essentially, but they're, they're still, I mean, these people are actually, because we've established that they're uh, actually unsecured debt, they're third-party debt collectors, is what these people are that are going into court. They're not telling the whole truth. Um, essentially, are, are there a lot of Gordon Grecos out there? Uh, quite a few. Uh, let's just put it this way. If George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were here, I think we'd have, um, we'd have uh, a lot of people in trouble. <laughs> okay, let's, let's take a look at a banker that actually apologizes she used to be one of those bankers. Her name is Candace Jones, and we had her here in the... Candace Jones, I'm sorry. Candace, tell us what you got. Uh, first off, I'm a retired banker. I'm not proud to say that today. You know, I'm not proud to say that today. I was for years up until the 90s, since I started in the 70s. Uh, and I personally have read the National Mortgage Settlement. I've read um, the TARP. Program. Uh, I read the, the DOJ, and one thing I could tell immediately when I read this, and Camilla Harris, I can tell that you didn't write this. I can tell that you probably had a few words in it, but the rest of it was written by the banks. One thing you can always be sure of with a bank is that they will promise you the moon, and in the end, they'll take it back. They have wonderful little words they love to slip in. And if anyone ever read the TARP, you could know that it was only suggested that they do modification for these people. Now, first off, I don't believe in these modifications because it's modified fraud, just as Renee said. These documents are fraudulent in everything I've seen. Over the last three years, I've probably worked with about 100 different people, friends that have come to me, because after I retired, they knew how long I'd been in the business. 
they knew also that I was an expert with the FDIC, and also I was with the Resolution Trust that took down the savings and loans. So, Camille, I have to tell you right up front, honey, I think you sold us out. I yes. think you sold out yes. California. Yes. And your citizens deserve much better than that. You're not the only attorney general that did it. All the rest of them did it with the exception of Snyderman. And we can be thankful at least one person or a couple there held out. But I truly am ashamed to say you're our attorney general. Well, do you want to look at the pictures? Because sure. we've only got 30 minutes left of the show. Okay. We didn't even get David on the line yet. Okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and go through this. Sure. This picture here is another victim of Wells Fargo. This is Ralph Wiedemann, and um, he was the um, custodian of my junior high school, if you can believe that. And um, he actually was abducted by a, um, a misconduct um, convalescent home. And um, they refused to release him. Um, that even, was in Orange County, too? Orange County. It's called Mesa Verde. Um, the director is Joseph Munoz. And essentially, he went in there in September of 2012 on the 24th of September. And he asked me on the 28th of September, Valerie, get the power of attorney, whatever you have to do, because they don't accept my benefits here in this place, my VA benefits. He was a three-time vet in the U.S. Marine Corps, highly acclaimed. He was actually an instructor, taught um, jet flyers yeah. how to eject from jets. And essentially, here he is with some of the Curry kids. We had a 30-year reunion. This was a dream of his life. He wanted to reunite with us. Um, and essentially what happened is uh, we had to go to court. And all of the kids from Curry, we actually got together to uh, pay him for his attorney fees to get him out of there. He was just such a kind-hearted man and just was a mentor to many of us. Um, he was an adult that truly cared about, you know, the, all the kids. Um, and on the end, a bank foreclosed on him and his house payment was only $400, but while he was locked up and held in this... Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde board and care, and he's a veteran of three wars. And he was also the chief security to the ambassador of India as well. Yeah, this is him. Again, he's actually teaching um, strategies within entering um, war areas here. And... Um, Essentially, yeah, his, his account was frozen primarily because what Mesa Verde did to me in order to block me from helping Ralph is they actually filed a false criminal charge with the Department of Justice against me Wow! in order to block me from helping Ralph. Okay, that's Ralph in the war being an instructor. Okay, so essentially what happened is Wells Fargo was given all this information as far as all the crimes that were being inflicted upon Ralph. And Ralph really wanted to go back to Mesquite, Nevada. That's where his heart was, to go back home. His payment was only $400 a month. Wells Fargo was sending me all of the mail, so I knew that everything was fine. But behind the scenes, a law firm by the name of Malcolm and Cisneros, a third-party debt collector, was filing fraudulent documents and stole his home on October of 2013. So he had no home to go to. We finally rescued him. We, had a, we were successful in getting a court of law to determine that that Mesa Verde place was harming him and not giving him his freedom. He pulled him out and it was a great, great moment. He uh, was able to get out of there escorted by the Costa Mesa Police Department. Escorted by the Costa Mesa Police Department? Correct. How did you get that muscle? We just knew that we were going to have to have some type of escort just because it was a, it was a, it was a great battle. It was a year and six months that we fought that. And this that. guy was 96 years old. 96, but he, he really had a lot more energy. He wanted to go back to um, India. India? To visit. At the, 96? At 96. And we had planned. We actually had the trip planned. <laughs> we were going to take caregivers. My aunt was going to come with us, and we were to go over there and visit Mother Teresa's projects. He, he actually met Mother Teresa. And Sorry we don't have the picture with the real genuine men in black and Ralph. My salute to you, Ralph Wiederman. God rest in peace. Yeah, so he did pass <sighs> away. You know, I wanted to also mention is that I took him to a new place. Um, and again, he was constantly asking, Val, are you going to be able to get that home back from Wells Fargo? This was between... May, when I pulled him out, and then... Of this August, year? Uh, yes, of this and year. And he passed about a month ago. August 24th, yeah. What happened is that um, the new place, they cared for him, but they didn't have the people skills, so I wanted to put him into a place in my hometown of Tustin. 
and the lady found out about it. So what she did is she went around my back and contacted the misconduct people at Mesa Verde, and they started slandering my name and started all over again. And it stressed Ralph out tremendously. At 96, he needed that kind of stress. Yeah. yeah. So then he ended up getting... Uh, we like should this. finish this before we get David on, because yes. David is going to take let's, us right to the this. end, I think. This will be really quick. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you what they did do. Okay, okay, so we know how they should have lawfully met with all the state requirements concerning negotiating and transferring and, and, and selling the, the complete negotiable, tangible documents that you can fill. So this is what they did. After they you signed the documents, they said... You know what? Let's let's forget the state of California. We're not going to do what they say. Let's strip the intangible obligation and let's sell it to Wall Street with illegal electronic documents. Illegal electronic documents. Let's sell it to Wall Street with the illegal electronic documents here. So and there it goes. There it goes. So it's now disconnected. It's disconnected. It's not packaged with a note. No. So this document, let's go ahead and just toss it in the uh, the closet, and in case we ever need it, we'll bring it into the courts and we'll hoodwink everybody and we'll waive this devalued note. That's why so many thousands can't find the note anymore when they're pressed for it. Well, some of them were destroyed. There was a, there was a Florida Supreme Court case where the Mortgage Association admitted that they destroyed the notes. Wow. Yeah, and um, wow. you can find that case. There's a website called OurLemon.com. It's O-U-R, lemon, like the fruit, dot com. And that case will be in there where you can find where they admit what they did. Wow. So essentially what happens here is California Commercial Code or your state's equivalent, 3203 subsection D says that if you sell only a partial of the paper note and fail to abide by the state laws, by doing all of the uh, negotiating, transferring the, the entire no, um, no, tangible um, mortgage loan package prior to going to Wall Street, then if you decide to choose those, that decision in not doing that, then this paper note is no longer negotiable. It's devalued. And because the payment stream, the debt, has been separated from the deed of trust, this deed of trust is now void according to Car Carpenter versus Lung, which is a Supreme Court case. So if the deed of trust is void, the homeowner is sitting in a position where he no longer has to pay anymore. That's legally. correct. Right. If you can get past all the hoodwinking and all the Kool-Aid But you've got to get past the hoodwinking. And the Kool-Aid that they serve at. And the crooked judges. Wow. That's just wow. And you've got to stop believing what they say. They'll tell you something, but just because they say it, it's not truth. So you've got to stop doing that. Yeah, don't necessarily a lot of people have lost their home believing and trusting their attorney was working on their case. Mm -hmm. What your attorneys mostly are working on is getting, shh, don't tell anybody, your money into their bank account. That's correct. You know, one thing we should dis discuss also very quickly here is a lot of people discuss about the, the endorsement where it says uh, pay to the order and it's a blank line. Okay, mm -hmm. the hoodwink attorneys, what they're doing is they're saying, well, it's a blank endorsement. No, that's not a blank endorsement. If you look at California Commercial Code 3-115, it says that is a paper note with an unnamed payee. And that note is not negotiable until that payee is named. And it will never be named primarily because we just discussed that they formed this mortgage-backed security, security unlawfully. So there will never be that line filled what out. What if somebody put a name in there anyway? Well, that's a material alteration, isn't it? Because they've already sold it. Right, and if there's a break in the chain of title, that's, that is clear indication that they did not abide by the state laws. That's why they claim it's a, it's a blank endorsement. They're crazy. And I mean, it's so, <laughs> it's so crazy. It, I mean, if you look at any business law book, it clearly states that it is merely an unnamed payee, and it's not negotiable. And, you know, the other thing I wanted to tell you, too, I have a friend, Ed Vallejo, you can find him on Facebook. Okay, he actually had a, um, a judge recuse herself because she admitted that um, she has investments with a certain bank and the bank has an investment with MERS, Mortgage Electronic Services, Services Systems. MERS, Mortgage Electronic Services mm -hmm. Systems. Right. And that is just kind of like a curtain which hides all the individuals that potentially own the payment streams. Of the unsecured debt. 
Is it just like a handful of people that actually operate the MERS system? That's correct. From what I hear, I mean, it, it's just a database is what it it's is. It's a database, but it's controlled by what? Five or six people nationwide have access to all your documents and everything. I understand. I, don't, I can't tell you that for a fact, but from my understanding, from the, the reading I'm doing, it's, it's manned by a very few handful of people. That is just phenomenal to think that you've got millions and millions of mortgages and notes and it's all electronically controlled by just a handful of people. I don't think we the people approved of that, did we? I don't think we did either. No. I don't think that matches any state code. No, I, I think it's unconstitutional if you ask me. Well, but you're not a Supreme Court justice, unfortunately, Valerie. Well, unfortunately, though, I know who I am, though, I'm an American citizen, and essentially we the people are the ones that invoke the laws here, and exactly. not the judges. I'm wondering if we have time to get, um, did we cover everything you wanted to get on? Um, I think that we pretty much discussed most of everything that we were going to talk about. So the payment stream has to be kept with the note not sent electronically off to Wall Street. If it isn't kept in all the chain of title, aren't, all the signatures aren't on the actual physical original wet ink note attached with the assignment of deed, mm -hmm. which has been continually recorded. All the way up to the last. All the way up to the last one before it gets put into a... Mortgage back, then at that point you can form mortgage backed securities. If that ain't all together, you've got a bad document that is basically unenforceably. That's correct. But you've got to press your right to do something. How would you suggest they do it? Just file bankruptcy and list it on Schedule F as an unsecured debt? They could do that, but they have to be very firm in understanding the crime because the the bankruptcy courts and the attorneys are going to try to, to hoodwink them and say, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. The point is, is yes, I can do that. The law says this is what should have happened. And what did you do? It doesn't look like you followed the law, did you? It's unsecured wow. debt. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are any of you going to want to ask to see your original loan package documents? Hello, are you listening? Because if you've had a refinance in the last 10 years, since one of these laws take effect 1999, they started invoking these requirements? Was it 19? Oh, no. As far as the California Commercial Codes, they've been in place forever. Okay. Well, then some of you need to go look at your original loan documents. Just observe everything. You want to put everything under a microscope and highlight everything. If you see any inconsistency, highlight it. You might want to get Miss Lynn Simoniak. Simoniak or Miss Valerie Lopez to help you look at those documents. Call me, I can put you in touch with them. Now there's a man that wants to explain something and why do we need to talk to David Roach? The primary reason is that um, David is just such a, a great educator in, in reminding us who we are. Hang on, David. We're going to put you on in just a minute. David's in the state of Indiana. David, do you want to explain to people the difference between a live birth certificate and a birth certificate? Go ahead. I got you on mic. Okay. Basically, the, the, the certificate of birth or birth certificate is the usufruct trust, the corporate soul. Now, the reason the courts call you by that name is because they can only contract with corporations. They need you to accept that name and say it's you. That's why anytime you look at your court papers, it's in all capital letters. Okay, okay I got so, that. All right. Now, the other birth certificate, which is the live birth certificate, the certificate that's actually you or record of birth, as it's sometimes called, has your name in the upper and lower case. And that shows the, the living soul, the, the child of God, if you will. And they're not allowed to contract with that. They're not allowed to have anything to do with the living man. And why is that, David? Because, because they're, they're, they were specifically, if you go to uh, Pinhollow versus Stone's administrators, the courts were told they could only uh, have anything to do or say when it comes to the corporate world. They could only contract with other corporations because they were... That was the area they were given, was the, was the area of commerce. Everything that they do has to be in the commercial. Okay, and, 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 commercial. and how is this uh, relevant to mortgage foreclosures and fighting in court, David? Um, because if 
you go to uh, HJR House Joint Resolution 192, 31 U.S.C. 3113, 31 U.S. 35312, and 28 U.S.C. 2041, and then 26 U.S. 3, I believe it is, and 26 U.S.C. 1275 and 15 U.S.C. subsection 1 and 12 U.S.C. 95 and then 1 U.S.C. 8, the person, and 28 U.S.C. 2045, which talks about investment of the court registry funds. All of these things show, when you put it all together, that these lower courts the state courts are supposed to be discharging the public debt due to the 1933 bankruptcy. David, so, would you kindly say that again? All of these lower courts are supposed to be discharging the debt due to the 1933 bankruptcy. You mean like even our home mortgage debt? Yes. Even our student loan debts? Right. That's why when you go into court, if you tell them that you are the authorized signature, these courts, they flip out, and you see that the, the guy bringing the claim for the foreclosure, he'll instantly start asking the judge for a dismissal of the case, all that kind of stuff, because the minute you do that, you make that court the trustee, and they're supposed to be discharging the debt. Have Can you reference somebody that I can interview on television, David, that's done this? Um, I, I don't know of the, of the who it is personally that's done it. I've heard some people talking about it, but there are cases where these people have walked in. Uh, there's a, a gentleman in Oregon who walked in and did this, and the, the guys, I mean, we got a big group of people who have been working on this for a long, long time. <laughs> I know someone. Yeah, you know, and he, he had his guy go in and do this, and the, what I got back from them was that within eight seconds of him telling them that he was the authorized signature for the name, that he wasn't the name but the authorized signature for the name, the guy who was bringing the foreclosure on his house instantly went to jumping up and down and demanding a dismissal, and the judge dismissed it. And why would he want to dismiss it? Because if he didn't dismiss it, they would have to discharge the debt to the United States Treasury in Puerto Rico like they were supposed to do. And the reason they don't want to dismiss it is because what a lot of people don't know about the Bar Association that's in charge of our law here in America is that in 1950, the 81st Congress deemed them a communist organization because they were caught shipping ammunition to Adolf Hitler during World War II, and they were also caught attacking the American public school system in order to dumb down the children. Well, they succeeded in the latter, David. Uh, I would agree, yes. So what do they do? They demand for a dismissal of the case they brought to foreclose on, and then what, do they refile again and hope you don't show up in court? Uh, well, they still haven't even refiled. So I'm assuming that they're just that they're just going to ignore it and leave it alone. So they're just you just stop paying on that home mortgage, and they leave you alone? Right. And, uh, but basically what happened with this, with this, with this issue here is to why they, why they don't want to discharge this debt is when they get you to claim the name, that all caps name and act as the corporate soul, what they're doing then is they're illegally leaning the trust, the trust, and they're creating fraudulent securities that they're then selling upon the market, which is, in, which is making the nation's debt appear larger than what it is. Wow. Thank you, David, for this conversation. We only have about five minutes left in the show. Sorry we got to you late. We'll That's have to right. have you back for another whole show, David. But thank you very much for this information. And do we have your uh, permission to broadcast and rebroadcast this? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I sent you a, a, a deal with all these laws on it. I saw it. I just didn't have time to upload it and bring it to the studio. Thank you very much, David. Have a good night. Well, that was David Roach in someplace near Indiana or Illinois. You said you know somebody who actually did this. Yes, I do. Um, gosh, um, Cindy in Arizona, um, Pilate, I, I'll get you the information, but she was successful in doing it. I tried to do it, and um, what happened to me is that Judge Kwan, Catherine Bauer, the ex-Bank uh, of America attorney, and Doug, um, Judge Ferguson, they sent the U.S. Marshal to my house. 
Wow. Yeah, pretty funny. But um, anyway, I... Were you laughing all the way to the, um, to the next hearing? Um, I was amused. I was amused, but I, you know, I wasn't too worried, really, just because they I They sent the U.S. Marshals yeah. to your house. Yeah, they, yes, they did. They really intimidated me. But once I told them, I just said, you know, look, you know, everything is by law. Look at the laws and statutes and just leave it at that. And did he go away? They did. And then I also told, made, reminded them that, you know, like my father was a, a, an acclaimed district attorney investigator and actually pretty well known throughout the country. So, you know. So this Pilate right. gal is in Arizona. Yes. We've got a locator. Yeah, you know, I think one other item that we should discuss before we leave also is the fact that, um, you know, these, uh, what's actually happening, we now know that they're third party debt collectors. So essentially, the servicer has no right to be foreclosing, number one, according to the federal statute. And okay. I, I actually found it. It's um, 15 U.S.C. Chapter 41, Section 1641, F, Treatment of Servicer, which yeah. pretty much just says that the servicer is not allowed to foreclose. Okay, And that's mostly who does the foreclosing. Correct. So there, you can kind of liken them to like a parking lot attendant. Okay? Yeah. So what they do is they say, hmm, we have all these stolen homes. So why don't we go ahead and set up a contract with LPS? We'll set up a, a contract with LPS, which is a title company. And then what we'll do, it's a, a default servicing agreement, is, I believe is what they, they set up. And they have what's called a flow agreement. Um, and so what they do then is then LPS will hire a network of attorneys. And the network of attorneys pays fees to LPS, the title company. Got it. Okay. So when these attorneys go into court, they're saying, oh, yeah, we represent Wells Fargo. No, they don't. They represent LPS and uh, companies that liken to LPS. Um, so they're debt collectors. And so they have to file like, all these fraudulent documents in order to steal these homes. And so it's very important for people to understand that. And then the other thing I wanted to, to let people know also is that we must stop these crimes, primarily because it's clogging up our economy. And the faster that we get rid of these third-party debt collectors who are ruining our courts and then ruining the economy, the faster that we can be more productive citizens of this country. So and not really be dying from stress like Ralph did. Exactly. And many other people have died from stress from having their house taken like Rex Phillips' wife and uh, Alan W. Courtney, who did go to prison, thanks to um, Mr. Phillips, doggedly forcing our DA, who was very reluctant in Santa Barbara County, to put an attorney in jail. But he did do a few years, not what he should have got for seven felonies, but he did do a little time. And due to my YouTube clip, He's finding judges are watching that YouTube clip and not wanting to reinstate his license in any state, hmm. which is a real problem. I'm sorry about that, Mr. Courtney, but when people come to you and they're on their last leg begging for legal help, you shouldn't be the last one to plant them in the ground and take their last equity out of their house by flip flying with Nevada corporations and making the money just mm -hmm. disappear. I'm sorry that you did that, Mr. Courtney. And I'm even more sorry, I'm digressing again, I'm sorry, I just, I'm more sorry, Mr. Courtney, that you promised Judge Garcia in the courthouse in this city of Santa Maria, and I heard you and I have you on tape saying, I can't pay restitution if I'm locked up in jail. Well, you're out of jail. And I haven't seen one dollar paid in restitution mm -hmm. to Rex or your own cousin. Not a dollar. And yet you hold on to all these properties and lands and live very well out in the countryside. While other people, Rex almost ended up homeless. Actually, he is homeless. He's living in a little tiny apartment now in Santa Maria because of you, Mr. Courtney. When are you going to start paying restitution? When is Judge Garcia or the sheriff going to force his... Uh, his homeowner's exemption money to be delivered to Rex. When are they going to hold you accountable, Mr. Courtney? When are the crooked attorneys, crooked judges, and crooked bankers going to be put in jail? I think Ms. Lopez, and y'all ought to give her a big hand of applause because she laid out the evidence 
that you can get rid of your mortgages if they commit a fraud. And I will probably be understating if I say only 50% of you listening that own homes or did own homes were defrauded and you didn't even know it. I thank you so much, You're welcome. Ms. Lopez. It's been a pleasure. It's not very often I have this caliber of person who used to package loans and got her training with Barron. I want to thank you all for watching tonight. If you want to rewatch it, look on YouTube. Uh, we'll have this up as a YouTube clip. Look at William Wagner on YouTube. And I'm William Wagner, hoping we gave you something that you can't find on ABC, Fox News, CNN, and ask yourself, why didn't you hear about this Lynn Simoniac. Simoniac over and over and over and over, like you heard about all the BS about some floozy who married a 90-year-old man and then he died and she wanted a big chunk of his stuff. Why did you hear that kind of nonsense over and over? It, it, you know, it, it drives me nuts to see how they propagand you and show you porn on television or, or soft porn, but they won't tell you anything you need to regain your constitutional and God-given rights. There you go. What do you think of David Roach as a person? I mean, what, what, do you, what do you classify him? Well, I consider both you and David Roach the Thomas Paines of our modern day, and oh. we need you. Wow, thank you, Dick. Thank you. Okay, that's our show pretty much in a nutshell tonight. Remember, if you get to look at your original note and you go check your county records and you see all the people listed as signing when it get transferred, and it doesn't match what's in the county recorder's office, you've got a big clue you need to get a hold of Miss Lopez or someone. I'm William Wagner for Take Back America with Valerie Lopez. See you next week. Program. Uh, I read the, uh, the DOJ. And one thing I could tell immediately when I read this, and Camilla Harris, I can tell that you didn't write this. I can tell that you probably had a few words in it, but the rest of it was written by the banks. One thing you can always be sure of with the bank is that they will promise you the moon, and in the end, they'll take it back. They have wonderful little words they love to slip in. And if anyone ever read the TARP, you could know that it was only suggested that they do modification for these people. Now, first off, I don't believe in these modifications because it's modified fraud, just as Renee said. These documents are fraudulent in everything I've seen. Over the last three years, I've probably worked with about 100 different people, friends that have come to me, because after I retired, they knew how long I'd been in the business. They knew also that I was an expert with the FDIC, and also I was with the Resolution Trust that took down the savings and loans. So, Camille, I have to tell you right up front, honey, I think you sold us out. I yes. think you sold out yes. California. And the citizens deserve much better than that. You're not the only attorney general that did it. All the rest of them did it with the exception of Snyderman. And we can be thankful at least one person or a couple there held out. But I truly am ashamed to say you're our attorney general. but I truly am ashamed to say you're our Attorney General.